we can give our children only two things in life which are essential strong roots and powerful wings then they may fly anywhere and live independently of all the luxuries in life the greatest luxury is getting freedom of the right kind these are the things of our next guest there are leaders and then they are transformational leaders who are able to inspire teams and nations and lead them to accomplish greater things this form of leadership involves two types of transformation performance beyond expectations and transformation of followers into leaders ladies and gentlemen please join me in according a warm and a hearty welcome to none other than padmashri shri sudha murthy author and philanthropist chairperson murthy foundation a leader who embodies the elements of transformation leadership in conversation with her we have chairperson npsc dr sudha acharya principal itl public school over to you ma'am namaskar it is my great privilege in to be in conversation with a personality who is an embodiment of simplicity who is an academician and engineer a philanthropist a movie buff and a social worker also resilient social worker she is none other than padma shri dr sudha murthy so it is our privilege and sheer delight to talk to you ma'am today your life is an open book for all of us once we start reading your book we fall in love with it ma'am now the whole country is talking about reading mission reading campaign you are aware that government of india is running a campaign for 100 days reading mission you know we all grew up reading books we have been with the habit of reading 20 lines at least before sleeping but how do we get children to read and these children who have their digital identity they have so much distraction they have facebook insta uh, linkedin all those things so how do we get uh, them to read i'll start with your childhood ma'am you belong to a, a family of teachers i would say so great value system that made you who you are today and you have always taken the right choices in my view wherever so um, very early you have started writing first of all uh, you started in your native language then you shifted to english little bit throw light on your childhood how it shaped your career your life uh, sudha ji thank you for inviting me as the chief guest for your valedictory function it is always a joy to talk to teacher because i come from a teaching family my father my you know, father was a professor and a doctor in a medical college my grandfather was a high school teacher my mother was a school teacher then i married into teacher's family my father in law was a school teacher and my brother in law is a professor so probably teaching is part of our dna and my era was different you know we should not compare that today because uh, today's scene is post liberalization okay and uh, my time was post india's independence both are so much there is so much difference vast difference is there so when i talk about my childhood people at this time or my grandchildren for that matter they will not be able to relate because it is entirely a different system where we lived it was a joint family with 13 cousins and nobody will have separate room then all of us will have same food not at what better what you want to eat it was not like that but it also helped us in so many ways to adjust to understand to to do activity of our age group in a village where i was born and brought up with no electricity around so physically i mean today when you look at it oh it was difficult but for us it was never a difficulty we grew up in a much more non competitive area and non digital area so there are a lot of things we learned when we were children like you know we learn knitting we learn thread work crochet then we also learned little bit of cooking we read a lot because the teachers so the real asset is not money but they are books and we enjoy reading books then understanding different languages like sanskrit the language which was learned 
and i now i look back i feel it was much more comfortable and easy and because it was non competitive era yeah very true ma'am nowadays we are stressing on uh, especially learning in primary years in mother language how do you feel and how it enhances learning in primary years teaching in mother language it depends on the, uh, it depends upon the parents because for example we did not have a choice i was in a village in a village having a school itself is a great thing and the native language is kannada which is our mother tongue so we learnt it i do not know if it were english what i would have been my reaction i really do not know but i did not have much choice the only thing was available in kannada and i learnt in kannada so i feel it was very easy for me because the language was spoken at home it was spoken in the village it was spoken in the state and spoken in the school there is no conflict but yeah. i i really do not know well, for example my children studied in a cosmopolitan city like bangalore in english medium okay yeah. their children study in much more cosmopolitan place like england with much more exposure to foreign language taking german or no, what they take uh, french spanish and chinese you know so every era it is so different yeah ma'am so uh, what i have learned from your life that you have always taken a road not taken a path which is less traveled or uncharted you decided to become an engineer at the age of 17 which was very revolutionary step at that point of time uh, maybe your family members wanted you to be a his- to pursue history or maths but it is because of sheer determination passion and your conviction you went wa- ahead and ma'am you know now also children are facing this problem peer pressure parent pressure self pressure and they want to do something on their own but the choice and decision making is not in their hands so they are lot more pressurized what do you advise them the young generation who want to pursue their love their passion somebody wants to be a singer or a player but father wants to be a doctor or engineer it's very difficult for them to deal with how should they deal with this problem i think it's more than children the parents i think yeah parents have to deal with it for example when i decided to do engineering in 1967 you know in a small society like a place like hubli everybody said oh it's a man's domain a woman cannot do but my father gave me the choice he said you want to do engineering you do you want to do medical you do you don't want to do either of them it's fine so it is the parents who really believe the children to what they wanted to become it was their yes. dream they feel their children should fulfill so i advise parents just allow children probably what they like to do because they'll be happy in that not yes, the children yes. they will not know at 17 18 it's very very few people know what they want to do most people feel what they like to do you at a late later part of life so please allow them to bloom naturally than a forced blooming yeah ma'am while you were doing your engineering also you are the solitary girl in your class you know so you must have faced lot of challenges even i know that you are the first female engineer in telco and specifically when you read that advertisement that female candidates did not apply which really distressed you and you wrote a, wrote a letter to jrd tata so how was your experience dealing with those dealing so many challenges in your engineering college also and what was your experience in telco well in engineering college i was aware it was not that i was not aware i was aware that i'll be the only girl throughout my education and i knew the boys may not cooperate because they were not used to seeing a girl third thing is is entirely a different subject and nobody will help me because my dad was a doctor but i always felt it i have a great belief in that if you work hard you can always achieve it and after first semester when i stood first in university i realized it's a more of a myth it's a more of a our imagination that it's a man's domain who said it's a man's domain you know women can do very well then i said okay more people think oh it's so difficult it is more in your mind if you work hard and if you are sincere you can do and that gives me enough confidence in it yeah ma'am you so, didn't tell uh, go yeah tell go when i went first time people used to look at me saying that what is this new girl 
what is she going to do? How can she do? But if you work hard, ultimately your work is appreciated, not your gender. Definitely. And ma'am, um, I have read somewhere that you leave home at 6 a.m. and come back at 10 in the night. So 15 hours together you are working. For you, work is a holiday, you know, work is worship, your passion. You know, these days, what advice you would give to our young generation? You know, ma'am, in school education, most of the workforce mostly constituted by female workforce, more than 90 percent, I would say. So uh, and more or less as a school leader or principal, I listen it very frequently that they get stressed out. How to manage that balance or maintain that balance, work and life? How they should uh, create their own support system? Could you say something out of your experience? Because very frequently we keep listening what pr uh, pressure or stretch, stressed out, uh, they are feeling low or anxiety. Uh, all these uh, symptoms we see in young generation. So how would you advise them or what would you advise them to maintain that work-life balance? Is it you're talking about teachers or students? Yes, ma'am. Teachers and students alike. Even young teachers also. Both are different. Teachers are different. Students are different. Yeah, yeah. Teachers, you know, married teachers, unmarried teachers, things are different. Married yeah. is the children. That kind of teachers, it is hard for them to make work. Life balance. You have to build a support system. If possible, stay nearer your parents' house or in-law's house and they should be willing to look after your children. Second thing is, you know, you build a social network in such a way that, you know, somebody will come and look after them for some time. Or, you look, you know, whenever you have holiday, you look after somebody's child and your children will be looked after by someone else, a good neighbor or something. More than that, your husband or your partner should help. Gone were the days when men will say, I'll go to office and bring money and wife will do. Oh, she will work in the office, come back and cook. And look after children. She can do three work, three types of work, and he will do only one. No. Today, youngsters, if they are married, their wives are working, they should pitch out their time and money uh, and responsibility. Then only a uh, working woman can do well. Behind every successful woman, there is an understanding man. Please remember, unless your partner or husband does not support, your family does not support, then it is very difficult or next to impossible for a working woman. Unless you get a very good maid or very good neighbor, you know. But better is your own family people helping it. For yes. youngsters, the peer pressure, but more than the pressure, it is the parents' pressure. You know, comparing, look at my brother's son, look at my sister's daughter. Never do that. Every flower in the gods is God's creation. Every flower is beautiful in its own way. So is every child is good in some or other way. Don't compare and destroy their life. Once this habit of comparison starts, then we, our children, when they grow up, they also start comparison. The root cause of misery in life is comparison. Life is an art. It, you know, it requires to understand what is an art, how to use that art. You know, as much as possible self-satisfaction, as much as possible improving myself than comparing with someone. These are the few lessons you have to learn in life. And, and then you should have, you should also play sports, or, you know, like, you know, you, you should have many activities that keeps you happy and deep. Yes, ma'am. So if I come to your philanthropist role, when you started, I, have, I was reading your book, 3000 Stitches. Even I have read how I got my grandmother to read or uh, wise or otherwise, uh, all these books. Uh, so uh, 3000 Stitches is talking about uh, your uh, really rescuing 3000 Devdasis at that time. So in 1960s, wearing a short hair, and a pair of jeans. When you started, then your father said that if you want to see the change, be the change. You be like one among them. So that was very, very inspiring, ma'am, how you started your journey. So uh, uh, your mission of establishing a library and a computer lab in every school in uh, Karnataka, uh, what was the project behind it? How the school libraries really influence school education? When uh, I started my work with Devadasi, it was not in 1960, it was 1996. 
1996 when i was 46 okay. years i started that and uh, digital literacy is a must today you know like how you can have a kitchen without a pressure cooker or a microwave similarly if you do not have digital literacy then you are outdated in the marketplace you should i always tell our children should have, you know their mother tongue and equally good english equally good english and they should have a skilled education with computer knowledge then only they are employable otherwise they are not employable i have seen in my last work so many people getting a degree not getting a job because there are no skilled job there are no skilled education so computer is not because you like computer it is a survival today it is a survival if you want to get any job you should know computer Yes, ma'am. And then uh, you have also constructed sixteen hundred toilets in rural areas, or more than that. And you have built roads in inaccessible areas. More so, you have given shelter to women. How do you feel providing a shelter empowers an, uh, a person, or uh, specifically a woman? We have built sixteen thousand toilets. Okay. Or sixteen thousand toilets. and we have done lot of empowering projects for women and i feel nice when woman is economically independent and emotionally independent can make her own decision then they are they will be able to lead their life much more meaningful than living in a scare or always living in a worry yes ma'am uh, i have read about your latest project that is uh, translating the classic scripts to english you know so what was the vision behind it or the thought process behind it actually it is not mine it is my son okay roman murthy started murthy classical library one side you know it it was the oh, one of those classic language other side the english translation so that next generation should feel you know for example kalidas the megaduta kalidas shakuntala many people don't read because it is in sanskrit suppose they make it in a simple english people like to read then they will understand the treasure treasure of our nation in terms of the literature we like to read shakespeare that is fine but you should also read our our own literature which is so rich and which is so famous the reason behind that is introducing in a simple language the literature literature of india ancient literature of india ma'am you have established also one classical uh, i think library in harvard university Uh, why did you choose actually uh, have a university for that? No, it is not that the same thing. Murthy Classical Library is, is looked up. Look that will started by my son, and he was studying at Harvard. So okay. he started there for the translation and printing. He did not have started a library there. No, it is only for publication and uh, translation. He is doing that. Okay, ma'am. So now you have retired from Infosys Foundation, and you are now uh, passionately working with uh, Murthy Foundation. Would you throw some light on Murthy Foundation and the work presently you are doing? Well, right now, actually, Murthy Foundation. I have seen three temples which were thousand years old and were not able to. Nobody repaired that. They belong to Mujrai Department. Or okay. So oh, I said. in rainy season it really leaks i so i am repairing it in summer those three projects then i am also working on a, 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 a documentary on river tungabhadra because that is the one of the rare rivers in india which touches two uh, most important sites that is the world heritage site on that i am working then of course i i do helping people in scholarships medical help all those but for yeah. the time being i want to work more on literature now okay during this pandemic ma'am uh, or unprecedented health emergency we can see uh, say that a uh, lot of children they were dropped out of school they have gone back to work and we saw also there is a rise in domestic violence because people lost their job people have lost their loved ones it was a time of distress really so as a teaching fraternity we try to bridge that gap now when children are coming back we see that learning loss also 
what would you say, say about this and what was your role during this pandemic pandemic we were, we worked very hard two years i did not get time we established a hospital with a 250 bed we had ambulance we will be we were admitting people particularly first and second wave not that much in third wave then very busy in getting people inoculated or the vaccinated uh, and then we also help people with the ration kits because many people lost their wages okay so we were extremely and digital literacy so we gave poor people laptop okay very so nice, we were extremely busy in, in pandemic yeah uh, because we have heard stories like uh, children losing their life without a gadget so they could not we, we it was very difficult to reach out to the last child during this uh, pandemic so, as uh, yeah you no know, that we did we bought laptops and we distributed yes ma'am npsc also as an organization of academician uh, we try to uh, provide that socio emotional well being or psychosocial support and even we distributed uh, Uh, winter warm clothes and dry ration wherever it is possible fed uh, the migrants also in our own little capacity because this is a voluntary organization of uh, school leaders only so dear I, i thought that this pandemic has brought us together and it's the greatest teacher uh, ma'am i can uh, summarize you that you have traveled from just mere a human being to being human i mean um, you are a personality who is who is a simplicity personified as yet has outreached the potential of human existence that's how i can describe you thank you thank you thank you so much it was a sheer delight and our privilege to have you amongst us in npsc thank you ma'am thank you for sparing your valuable time thank you i wish you all the best all teachers you i belong to your fraternity you are doing a good job in our country a teacher is you know traditionally a teacher is very responsible person we say matrudevo bhava the first is always the mother second one is pitrudevo bhava that is your father and number three is acharya devo bhava it is a teacher a teacher has a magic wand who takes a child ignorant child with that wand over a period of time he or she changes into a, a knowledgeable person you have a great responsibility and it is the one one of the thing uh, most joyful profession because you are always with the youngsters so you become young at heart so i am very very grateful to addressing teachers and particularly principals who are holding a responsible position i wish you all the best thank you thank you thank, thank you, you ma'am namaskar thank you jai hind thank you ma'am for such an insightful session